I was having a chat with my uh, friend Colin, who does the Comic Book Manifesto YouTube channel. And I told him that I've only been reading independent comics since 2019. And he thought it was interesting because I told him that before that I was 95, 99% big two, maybe some boom in IDW, but mostly Marvel and DC. And he just thought it was interesting because usually when you read big two, you are big two for life. And you saw with somebody that was interesting how somebody did this switch, especially after reading comics for so many years. So he thought it might be an interesting story to tell. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. Hopefully I'll keep it quick and moving and it's not too bad. But there's a lot of lessons along the way about comics that I um, learned while doing this. So I had had a long dissatisfaction with big two comics. Um, I think Axel Alonso did a lot of interesting things when he first became um, editor-in-chief, but I think by the mid-2000s, a lot of things that they were doing comics were kind of like uninspiring. I mean, there were some interesting things, like I liked the introduction of Ms. Kamala Khan as Ms. Marvel. Uh, I thought I think she's a great character. And also the Jane Foster as Thor story. I liked that a lot because I found Jane Foster to be a much more interesting Thor than the regular Thor. But um, I was getting kind of bored with them. And I was doing that thing where a lot of people do with superhero comics or comics. They just keep buying the issues and they really don't like them. Maybe they don't read them. They flip through the art, but they keep buying them because they keep buying them. And um, I wasn't reading DC because I thought the New 52 was terrible. And a lot of the sales prove it. The, as a side note, I think Dan DiDio and Zack Snyder and a few people got the wrong lesson or learned the wrong lesson from... Uh, the Dark Knight Returns and the Watchmen, the success of those books, um, they thought that all oh, those books are really successful, so everybody wants dark, so we're gonna make everything dark. Those books were successful because A, they were made by creators that were either at the peak of their powers or close to the peak of their powers, and B, they stood in contrast to a whole lore of superheroes as being good guys and virtuous. So they stood out because A, they were made really well, and B, because they stood out as contrast. This is why I like the Superman and Batman team up kind of works because you have two guys that really are total polar opposite and how they approach life in general, much less superheroing. So it kind of works in that way. Um, and I think that when they decided to make New 52 and make the villains and the heroes very close to each other with only a few shades of gray difference, I think it just, at first it popped because it was new, but then after a while it just didn't have any sustaining power. So I was just really unhappy with comics and I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe I'm just going to stop reading them. So in late 2017, Marvel published X-Men Grand Design. And I really enjoyed this series and I enjoyed it because he was able to make a comic featuring the X-Men that was actually interesting. Um, I had liked the Grant Morrison run them quite a bit. And then after that, it just seemed like the X-Men were just really terrible. I know that uh, Perlmutter, who was running things at Marvel, one of the movie rights couldn't get him. So he really pushed the X-Men down low on the priority list. So that was one of the reasons why their comics weren't very good. But overall, it, it made me realize that it wasn't the characters that I thought were were like boring. It was the way they were written and drawn that I thought was boring. And I think part of that was because one, they're, and I'll get to it later, but also, like I said, I have been reading comics in 1974. I've read so many superhero comics, good and bad, that after a while, you just kind of get bored with it. I mean, there's only so much you can do. So I started following Ed Piscor on social media. And then eventually when he, launched his cartoonist kayfabe channel on YouTube along with um, Jim Rugg, I started watching that. And just as a side note, I'm not one of these Ed Piscor fanboys um, that think that the sun rises and sets on him. He's like a lot of cartoonists. I like some of his, I like some of his work quite a bit and there's some of his work that I don't care for at all. Um, but I will give credit where credit is due. He made X-Men Grand Design. He made it very interesting. And it's by far the best of the Grand Design uh, books that have been published by Marvel. Um, I'm not going to get into the other ones, but it's, by far it's the best one. So, and also secondly, Ed Piscor before the channel was like 
chill and e cool and approachable and you could chat with him um he was pretty mellow and then it, it, then when he got the channel all of a sudden he morphed into this um smack talking dr dre 1993 cosplaying guy and to create i guess an image like out of wrestling um i don't know and i don't really care but it was just interesting because it, that was a little interesting thing to see him morph from one character to another. And I've always wondered which one is the real one. Um, because I'm always interested in human behavior. But I digress. So with the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel, um, I also joined a Facebook group that was sort of like a super fan group. A Cartoonist Kayfabe Ringside Seats. I haven't been a member of that group in about a year. Um, and I'm not going to get into that group. But... When it first started, it was more focused on small press and independence and people making their own comics. It was also during the pandemic, so people were just kind of like reaching out socially. I made a ton of friendships on that group. I'm still friends with those people online. Um, I've met Nate Garcia there, Jeff Manley, uh, my friends Craig, uh, Richard Hine from the UK. Uh, just a lot and just so many other people that I've met in that group that I could just spend like five minutes reciting names but I was exposed to all these different types of books and all these other um stories and then the kayfabe cartoonist channel were doing I mean they did their wizard reviews which I kind of like never watched because I remember wizard back in the day and I thought that magazine was trash but they also would f focus on these independent classics and one day they mentioned um, what became to me like a game-changing book that kind of gave me an epiphany on comics, and that was Akira. I read Akira volumes one through six in 2019. Thank you very much, Miami Day Public Library System. And this series really opened my eyes as to the potential that was only not only a manga, which I had read bot manga that was the DC. Uh, reprints of the Batman manga that was done um, in the 60s but um, not really because I always thought that all manga was like shown in manga and it was just I'm too old for that stuff I didn't know that in Japan people just keep reading manga it's just that they buy different manga as they get older so I read Akira and this showed me what you could really do in comics this blew my mind this this is and what I really found interesting with this is that for the first time in years maybe decades i really had no idea where this story was gonna go i mean in superhero comics the villain the hero's never gonna die the villain's probably never gonna die uh, somebody close to hero is never gonna die permanently um you know they die and they come back to life so you always know like well i know somehow it's gonna end where they're going to be okay or whatever. But with Akira, I had no idea what was going to go on. And I really loved that. I loved not knowing. It was that sense of discovery that um, you have in comics when you're a kid because you don't know the history, you don't know all the lore, and you don't know that they're going to come back and everything seems so final until you've read them for a lot of years and you realize nothing's really final in superhero comics. But with this, this was final. And I, I just found that really exciting, exhilarating. So that led me on to reading um, works by Azuma Tezuka, uh, Yoshihiro Tatsumi, who's like my favorite my favorite manga. I wish there was more translated in English about his work. Um, I started reading Dan Klaus, Chris Ware, Charles Burns, uh, Noah Van Skyver. I, I started reading just all this great stuff. And it just... Again, I was reading books and I was like, how's this going to end? How's this going to end? I don't know. You're creating these characters and these characters are not going to potentially live forever or exist forever. This is just a snippet. It's like European films where this is the portion of the life of this character. It's not like American cinema where everything has a happy ending or they leave an ending open for a sequel. This is just the life and that's it. And I found that completely refreshing. So the more I started reading these types of stories, the more I wanted to read them. And the less interesting the big two were. And I'll be frank, I just don't find the stories interesting. And it's not because, you know, 
of the characters. It's just, I just don't find the work interesting. I mean, this is why they have to reboot stuff every several years because they run out of stories to tell within the framework that you have. And I think if you have Batman who's been around for almost a hundred years, um, how many stories can you tell about Batman? How many times do you have to reinvent him until it just gets old? I understand why they do it because there's so much money with the IP, especially with the video games and the movies. But as far as the comics, to me, it's all redundant. People tell me, oh, you know, so-and-so had this great run on Batman and uh, you should read it. And it's like, look, man, I I've read the runs of Batman by Steve Englehart. I've read uh, runs on Batman by all-time great creators. Um, I don't think somebody's going to do something better than that. Maybe in some ways it's cooler, more relevant to the current times. But as far as stories, I don't see it. So after reading a lot of these classic comics, uh, classic, you know, you know, like uh, Klaus's uh, The Death Ray and a lot of Tezuka's work, as I mentioned, I was looking for new work because it, it it's sort of like music. I, I don't know about nowadays, but when, but when it, when I was, I used to listen to a lot of music before and the music's really important to me. After a while, you still have, you have to buy new music. You can't just listen to the old stuff. Now, some people are happy to do that. Listen to the old music that they grew up with and that's what they want to listen to. But for me, that gets boring. You keep the old stuff fresh by listening to new stuff. So then you can go back and appreciate the old stuff. And for me, it's the same way with comics. So I was looking for new stuff and then you had the pandemic and you have social media and I started talking to people that I knew in the Facebook group and they started saying, Hey, have you heard this? I heard about that. And then I started going on saying, Hey man, how about this person, that person? So I discovered people like actually in the Facebook group, I discovered, um, I met, uh, Nate Garcia. Uh, this is horn ring number one, um, that he printed at home. Um, I, when I read this, I saw the Klaus influence and I knew that he had something. And I'm not saying I discovered him, I didn't, but I knew then he had something. I even told him, you got something in here. Um, I discovered Simon Hanselman, who had been around for years. I was not aware. Um, Alex Graham, I loved Dog Biscuits. Um, I actually stopped reading the last month of Dog Biscuits online because I wanted to get the print and read all of that book. Um, Dog Biscuits is a book personally to me that has a lot of... Um, Meaning, I have a page of the original art. I think it's just master book. And became a fan of hers. I became a fan of Josh Pettinger. And there's so many other great independent cartoonists that are doing great work. That it, it, it's great. I, I, I'm enjoying comics now more than I have in maybe 30, 40 years. Probably since the 80s. Because in the 80s, you actually had a lot of cool stuff that was going on in superheroes. You had Alan Moore, you had Frank Miller, you had John Byrne. You had people that were doing interesting things with um, superhero genre. Um, but now I think all that's been played out. And now I'm finding all this other interesting stuff. I'm reading newer manga. I'm reading, going back and reading older manga, um, which I'm enjoying as well. So I think that for me, the switch was just because I had been looking for something that would keep me interested. And I found it. And I was lucky enough to have 30, 40 years of old comics to go back into and, to, and read them through collections from the library. And during the pandemic, I remember like, I had a feeling they were going to shut things down where I live. So I checked out about 15 books from the public library before things got shut down. So I had a ton of collections and you know, some things like that thick to read. And um, that helped a lot. So that's really it. Um, I, I, it's, it's not the characters. It's not that I'm being anti-corporate or anything. I just don't find um, somebody's run on Swamp Thing interesting now because I still have the Alan Moore Swamp Thing run from the 80s and there's nothing that you can do with Swamp Thing that is better than that. Um, same thing with a lot of comics. It's like you're gonna like you're gonna like do Daredevil. You're gonna like top Frank Miller's run from like 1980 to the early 80s. I'd like to see that. Um, so that's really where I am. So I hope that you found this somewhat entertaining. Um, and anything that I've learned is 
Keep looking for new stuff. Don't, don't, don't just keep buying comics, the same comics every month because don't keep collecting Spider-Man because you've always collected Spider-Man for the last 15 years and you have every issue. Why? If you don't like it, comics are not cheap. Get something that you really like that you can read and escape and really appreciate the craft and the work that goes into it, whatever it may be. And if you like superhero comics and you love that, fine. But if you're buying them and you just buy them every month and you're flipping through the pages and you, you just like, yeah, but I really, I just look at the art, whatever. It's just a waste of time. Find something you like. There's so many great comics being made that you can, um, you can just find something you like. Anyway, that's it. Thanks for your time. Bye.